Assalamu alaikum everyone, we are in Afghanistan, yeah. I'm here with Lord Miles. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, I, was, I want to say hello, uh, Shalom. <laughs> he insisted on the hats. Yeah, I'm going to say Shalom to the Taliban, you guys will see that later um, in my beheading video too, so it should be good. <laughs> anyway, we've been here a few days now, we were planning to do this interview the first day we arrived. Yes. However, uh, one thing after another that needed to be done, such as hat buying. And um, now we're here, so I've written a list of questions I think we'll go through. Yeah. And uh, there may be a lot of people who don't know who the hell you are. So I'll we'll start with the base question. I just being, know myself. Uh, who the hell are you? My name is Lord Miles. I go to Afghanistan in dangerous places for mostly film, journalism, and shit posting in general. I don't even know why I do. I, I question that myself every single day, late at night. I've just fallen into this because I was at the fall of Kabul as the last ever tourist in Afghanistan, got evacuated. Pretty fun time, actually. Same with Ukraine, South Sudan, Kazakhstan, all over last year. So what can go wrong in the future? That's me. I guess we'll see. I suppose the uh, next question is sort of, because people know you from the fall of Afghanistan and, you know, a funny meme man posting on 4chan. No, I take this stuff very seriously, guys. <laughs> but with regards to your actual background, so yes. I, I don't know how much detail we should go into or how it's appropriate, yeah. but just sort of, because I know you were studying physics at university when you oh, first yes. went on your trip. Oh yes, yeah, so I was studying physics, and then I realised that's kind of useless for what, what, what I want to do. I was, going, I was going to go into investment banking, so I worked my way into there uh, with a Chinese firm, worked some summer internships, uh, winter internships too. Had everything lined up, and I thought one last holiday before I worked 90 hours a week, like I'm almost doing right now. Um, just to enjoy myself, I thought. Sense of adventure, maybe? Yeah, basically. And to be fair, there was only one country that was open. And that was Afghanistan because it was COVID times. So I thought, well, sure, why not? And I just popped out of Afghanistan as you casually do. I mean, you previously mentioned you looked at a list of countries where it's you know bad to be a Christian. Yeah. And that was also part of the reason why you came here. Yeah, it was a top one. So I thought I'll do some donations, do some charity work. And I, you know, I didn't mind the danger. I, I know the risks from that. Okay. But your uh, life got twisted upside down when you came here. Um, I think it turned right the right way up. <laughs> But it's really good. My understanding is because you were just basically a physics student who wanted to have a bit of fun. Just a humble investment banker and physics student, yeah. And then the university, because you, you were going to get your tour guide out, so you oh, wrote yeah. a book about this, you got yeah. a publisher, and oh, yeah. then, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the university wrote to you and said, you can't publish the book or we're not giving you the degree. Yeah, they basically said um, along the lines of, uh, we don't like what you did, you caused some backlash for us, um, even though, you know, you you might have uh, worked through complaints and a lot of it was false news and everything like that. Like I took a space on the evacuation flight. Not true. It was a, it was a private flight for, for non-Afghans. So I told them, hey, I'm writing a book. I've already signed a deal. I can't back out now. It will cost me like a life savings to back out from legal fees alone. They said, well, you know, you can't do that. And I said, no, no, it's for charity work. All the money would go towards my old tour guide. Um, you know, it will be published after I graduate, what's the problem? They said, no, you can't do it if you do, kicked out of university. So I was like, okay, um, fuck you, I left university and I've never looked back. So I when I tell most people this, there's two responses, which yeah. is, you know, one, did you get your money back? <laughs> it, well, here's the thing, it was free, because when I, in my company, I pay myself uh, minimum wage, but my... My actual company is doing quite well. So I, I mean, from the university, did you get your money back? Of course not, no. But I don't have to pay back any student loans. I never paid a penny, really. Okay. Yeah, and so so uh, as long as my company keeps going, as long as I don't have a normal job, thankfully, I never have to pay a penny back to them. And that's the funny thing. And at the same time, I've got a different name now. So I, I've changed my identity so many times, legally. So I can always go back to the university with qualifications I already have under different names and finish the degree, and they would be novel wise when they can embarrass them. I'm just thinking of so revenge. you may go back and do gender studies for a laugh? Or yeah, I might do like sociology or something, and yeah, ancient Afghan studies, you know. Yeah, yeah I'll be a professor. And the other response I get is yeah. just, who the hell do the university think they are? Because you went on a yeah. legal trip, there was nothing illegal about oh, it. Yeah. You got out, it, it was advice that the country would last for 30 days, you would have been fine, and then yeah. that turned out to be false I spoke, news. I spoke to ambassadors, governments, news agencies, uh, government websites, I had, uh, you know, I had protection, everyone said it was going to be fine. Uh, if you said the country wouldn't last 60 days, you would have laughed at, and then of course it fell within a few days. So, um, But then what business is it of a British university to say that because you've done that, how, for example, have you embarrassed Loughborough? 
Oh yeah. Well, they don't actually care about themselves because uh, they only care about their reputation. So they don't care about their students or anything. It uh, doesn't matter what you do for the university. For example, I got a lecturer kicked out who raped students from Tinder. He would catfish them and rape them. Uh, he got quietly let go and I got told not to say anything, of course. Um, so I did that for them and of course that wasn't repaid. They were like, oh, well you gave some bad publicity. Uh, I think 20 complaints, most of them just schizophrenic ramblings. Most of them I can disprove too. Um, some people who are ex-friends of mine were writing to the university getting me kicked out. Um, with evidence that made no sense and they got disbarred, but they were really put in the evidence case. So they, the university are just completely out of line, I believe. And that's what it's like across all universities in the UK, mostly, as you've probably seen. Oh, well, I mean, in that example, I, I really do believe they're absolutely scumbags. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, um, there was one thing they said, uh, there was one thing that really pissed me off. I was doing a live stream in a room just like this during the fall of Kabul and someone said why don't you pretend to be Jewish to get out of Afghanistan not knowing that it's a Muslim country or something maybe they thought you know, Jews are in and out no issue so I said oh no I'm glad to not be Jewish and then I went on to say um, you know Jews will be executed here they're hated it's a strict Muslim country it makes sense right they said that I was anti-semitic say I'm glad I'm not Jewish as a strong Catholic yeah, and they, they tried to they tried to um, get me to pay a fine for saying that. Plus, take the university did. Yeah, and plus take diversity training. So I'm like, you know, that's that's stupid. Um, I don't need diversity training. I don't believe in that stuff. I'm a Catholic. I'm against all that stuff. I actively wrote out that very basic Catholic beliefs to them. And they tried to get so, a Christian who was non-Catholic to say that all this uh, LGBT, uh, pro-Muslim, uh, pro-Israel stuff is Catholic. I'm like, it's clearly not. Like, I know my basic beliefs. And they said my beliefs were concerning. I'm like, well, those are very basic Catholic beliefs. <laughs> but I mean, I'm sure everyone in the West will be aware at this point. Just not, well, being any type of conservative is a concern for any university. Of course, but those university bureaucrats, they're scumbags, they're losers, they work 90 hours a week for a little bit of power that actually doesn't mean anything at the end of the day. I've surpassed them in every single way, and at the end of the day I'm going to have a final laugh because I've got some plans. Alrighty, well, I suppose we'll move on to the next question, which is, so you came here the first time, collapse, second time you tried to get your tour guide out, and yes. then he didn't want to leave, so you came yeah. in for a second time. Yes. I don't know if you want to say something briefly course, about that. Yeah. Oh. So my tour guide for my first trip was being targeted by the Taliban, supposedly. That's what he told me. He would call me up in the middle of the night, crying, begging for some help. I wrote 500 plus emails to embassies, charities and so on. No one wanted to help. I put together a plan where I basically wanted to rescue this guy. So re-entering Afghanistan, sneaking him out through a second border illegally. I drafted uh, 100 page, 200 page documents on how to do this. I got ex-military people to help me out with this. It was six months planning. I invested pretty much most of my life savings and a good chunk of donations and it just completely fell through. I had every single Taliban checkpoint plotted in Kabul so I could figure out a route to get in and out without being spotted. I can still provide that too. But uh, he just freaked out when I reached the Pakistani town, the border town of Bashar. So he was saying, oh, uh, no, you, you will risk your life. Don't do it. It's too dangerous, blah, blah, blah. So he didn't benefit, any, he didn't benefit in the end. He just didn't want to go through it, with it. He was sitting in slums. And he doesn't want to get out. And ever since, he's just refused. Um, so his life's screwed, but he doesn't want to risk it further by trying to get out to, say, Turkey or Iran or Pakistan. And then you decided, well, I spent all this money, I come all this way. I was, I was actually devastated because I felt like I betrayed some trust with some people who actually donated. So I gave them the documents proof to say, hey, look, this is what I did. And then I said, literally, I can refund some of your money. Like, I'm very sorry. And they were like, no, no, we trust you. It's fine. I was like, thank you. But I felt extremely guilty. I've really seen bad. the pictures of you crying, which we can't Yeah, be. I haven't cried in like five years. That was the one time I felt upset. It was beyond grief. I, it was all bottled up. It was insane to me. Like, the, the fall of Afghanistan, I loved, but, you know, <laughs> you know like, people would cry and get angry. I was there, like, this is great. But having this what, fall because of the adrenaline? Or? Mixture, yeah, something like that. But six months of planning this whole thing, spending eight hours a day on my laptop, just Googling nonsense, typing up documents, doing networking, trying to see if you ever pay with contractors, it destroyed me. So I thought, screw it, I'm going to stumble into Afghanistan and see what I can do. Maybe I can salvage some footage, get some content. 
um, sh uh, buy some goods up and sell them to recoup some losses because I actually lost money at the end of the day. So um, went into Afghanistan, met the Taliban, they seemed like chill guys, you know. I I'm aware of all the stuff they've done, like fair enough, but when I met them one to one, they were kind to me. I, I judged someone like that, I'm not going to read any uh, left wing news articles and base my opinion off that. But you've also, you're doing it on your own personal experience. Yes. This is what your experience of the situation yeah, exactly. is. Yes, exactly. I'm not right. saying I'm the UN, I declare uh, your Taliban are family friendly, go hug them in the streets type of thing. I'm saying I went there, this is my experience, it's cool. If I went to a place, even if it was dangerous, I would say bad things about certain groups if I didn't like them. Like, I had the same thing in South Sudan, very uninviting, I was being honest, I wanted to like the country, but uh, I had issues. So, I wasn't biased or anything. That was my personal experience. I, I do remember that, and you got backlash uh, from South Sudanese people for it, for saying this place is... That was pretty funny. If any, nah. if any South Sudanese that are watching are, um, are hating well, on me, well, well, uh, I am I am going back again, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> so it's all good. But that's that's the second time, and then you messaged me, or told me, I can't remember, frankly, yeah. and said uh, you were going back a third time, do I want to come? Uh, why did you want to go back a third time? I thought... I didn't get enough footage. So the issue was, every time I filmed something, it would either get deleted by um, the army or the government, so Ukraine that happens. And I just didn't know what I was truly doing. And at the same time, I realised there's so much footage in Afghanistan. No tourist comes here, for some reason. And <laughs> there's no YouTuber who comes here and does a good YouTube video post-takeover, right? So I think some content would be really good. At the same time, we can donate some money as we go, a little bit here or there. And we can also buy up some goods and resell them because they were quite popular and I can use that to fund my other trips instead of just doing a GoFundMe. Pays for the expenses rather than just yeah, being exactly. like, please give money. And yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. It's like, I got, come, I got to have more revenue streams, have a little cushion of money, should be good. And at least give some people, you know, something to... Yeah, because... Claim to, yeah, I mean, boost, it basically boosts the Afghan economy by like a percentage point, I imagine. I mean, my next question was going to be, what the hell are we doing here? Yeah, what are we doing here? <laughs> Because I, mean, I, I agreed, and I, you know, I was... I mean, Callum, you know when I invited you, I did that as a joke. I sent to like 50 did you? people. Oh. Yeah, and then most of them... I was the only idiot who fell for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, hey, any root cars want to come? And you were like, me. And I was like, oh shit, okay. Did no one else say yes? Uh, a few did, but they were like, it doesn't line up with my work holiday. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You totally, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's well, the only yeah. reason I'd love to come. See, my girlfriend wanted to come with... With her being like blonde hair, blue eyes, you know, petite. White woman? Yeah, white woman, Polish girl. She would not fit in and I can't guarantee her safety. But with you, you're not... Uh, I don't have to guarantee your safety. Yeah, yeah, you're not as attractive as my girlfriend, so I think oh, you should nice. be fine around some Afghan men. You know, just in case. Alright. Oh, casual rape joke of the interview. Okay. Okay, so uh, that's good to know. So I just fell for it. <laughs> so um, we're just having fun, I guess. We're just having a goofy time. Hanging out. Lawn to Arabia maxing, right? Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, so we've been here for a few days, as I said, we were meant to do this first day, but from what I've experienced so far, this is nowhere near as bad as my advisors. <laughs> <laughs> it's culturally very similar, but it, it's nowhere near as bad as my uh, people who are advising me about this yeah. said it might be, yeah. and on the ground, just walking around, taking taxis and whatnot, it feels perfectly safe in regards to just my personal experience. It almost feels too safe, yeah. You know I mean? Yeah, there has been a bombing every single day we've been here, yeah. but the place is so big you never hear it, you never see it. The Taliban are actually, whenever you see them, I feel safer. Yeah. The Taliban and I have a mutual agreement. I'm kind to them, they're kind to me, we don't cross each other nice stuff. I remember you stating uh, through your research what you think Afghanistan's going to be like and every other journalist, and you get the impression of, bro, as soon as you step out of the airport, you'd have to duck instantly because I'll shoot you, mate. And then you've got a call to the hotel, and then you've got to take like 50 medications because you've got like 50 different diseases. And then you've got to get behind a shield every night because a rocket launcher would come through your window. Like Hillary Clinton style. Yeah, but. landed it's... under sniper fire. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible it, It's actually quite peaceful. Like, I honestly feel safer <laughs> walking through <laughs> it. <laughs> it's the BLM thing. Yeah, what, what do you mean? We are mostly peaceful. <laughs> oh, yeah, so it's cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Daesh are mostly peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, not my thing. Uh, no. Taliban are fine, no. Daesh, no. I mean, that, that, that is something I wanted to mention as well. We were walking the other day in the dark on the way home to someone. Oh, yes. And uh, I saw these headlines, a YouTuber in front of me, 
and then it sped up this car and then slowed down as it got towards us and I thought, oh fuck. I mean the back of my head was going, this is ISIS, this is the end of my life. Yeah. And then I saw the Taliban. Yeah. I was like, oh, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were like, oh white boy, go, go white boy, go white boy. <laughs> anyway. it's, we went to a weapons market too, that was interesting, wasn't it? Yeah, we went to a weapons market, there were guns being sold, yeah. silencers, ammunition. sights, but ammunition. Most anything. people in plain clothes, so the issue, yeah, the issue was, some of them might have been Daesh or ISIS, um, so we were probably 20 to 50 meters away from an ISIS member at any given point, to probably brush shoulders with them, which is a funny thought to think. It's, it's incredibly goofy to put it lightly, right? <laughs> we didn't stay very long, because yeah. you realise people started to talk about Arab Yeah, they were like, there's a white guy here. What's he doing? What's he buying? And we were just buying flags and patches and headbands. <laughs> and some uh, Hello Kitty t-shirts. So true. Honestly, you should have worn that at the interview. I will show one at the end. I of course. Uh, my next question was just, um, so I mean, you were a physics student. You had your career sort of laid out in that sort of regard. Oh, yeah. And everything went to pop uh, in that regard. Yeah. So, it, I mean, is this your life now? Is, is this it? Is this what you want to do for the rest of your life? I kind of hope so. Well, the thing is, if you look at people like Boulder Bankrupt, who go to Russia and sometimes Syria and stuff like that, they make a good amount of money, like two million in two years. And I'm not being mean to him, I, I love the guy, but Russia can only get so interesting. But with Afghanistan, it's a, it's a next level, is it? No YouTuber has it. So I'm cornering this small market. I can go to Somalia, Afghanistan, Derry and Gap, but I, I could pretty much go anywhere. I've got the knowledge, the stupid, stupid motivation. So the risk reward in your head yeah, is a bit weird. The risk, <laughs> the risk is very low. The reward is very high. <laughs> but this could be my life because it could pay off. And if I make a like a cool sum of money, if I could retire off, it's retire. Because I know if I keep gambling, something will go wrong eventually. Especially with my forties, I have a family, and so on. But at the same time. I thought like I would be unemployable, but I changed my name legally on all documents. So I could walk into any job. I've got fake social medias too with underneath the different names. I could walk into any job and be absolutely fine. All my qualifications are in my new name too. So any job I want, I can I can leave this life behind. It's like Filthy Frank and Joey, was it? You know Filthy Frank, that YouTuber? Yeah, I know Filthy Frank yeah. and Joey. He, uh, he changed his identity and became a oh. singer and you know, it went fine. So I can do that too. I joined my physics degree. I also did a level six diploma in banking and finance, which is equal to a full degree. So technically I can go into a banking job anytime I want. And most of my followers are incredibly generous and kind. They DM me going, hey Miles, if things ever fall through, I've literally got a job in the US, pays $25 an hour, come, come work for me. And I've gotten like hundreds of those. So if anything, this has helped my career prospects. <laughs> Get kicked out of university. I mean, that's... That's certainly true. I mean, everyone I know and myself have found that in life, which is that it's not what you know, it's who you know. Yeah, honestly, if if you think it's qualifications, hell no. Um, most nerds have this fantasy, this revenge fantasy that the jocks will become losers, and then the nerds will go on to rule the world because they're so intellectually superior. You know. However, it's all about the connection. You've got to know people and provide you know, a yeah. special service. And if, if people like you and you're retarded, they'll still employ you because they like you. I'm definitely retarded. Not too sure about the like a bit. So, like, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it seems to work. Uh, I suppose on the, on the traveling front, is there any place in the world you won't go? Mm. Maybe Israel. Bit dangerous? Uh, I won't go in for reasons, but I think my followers might know. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I do have some friends in the Israeli army that did invite me, so potentially, if the conflict breaks out. I'll go anywhere. Um, maybe not prison. I want to go to prison. That's the one place I want to go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Team with the Taliban prison too much. Oh yeah, I don't want to get put in prison. I mean, so, um, you know, I have to wake up a reasonable time. I have to work a wagey job. I don't know. What, what do you think? Um, there's so many countries, so many places. Well, I, mean, I feel like South America makes me hesitant, if that makes sense. North Central Island I would definitely go to, that's actually a plan. I just wait for the funding and the networking to play through. So I, I would always think of four places on planet Earth that I would absolutely under no circumstances go to. London? Uh, third, uh, no. So number one would be um, South Sudan, but you've done that. Go again next month. Somalia, as in not Somaliland, but Somalia itself. Yeah. You'd do that? 
I would, but I'd have to pay some armed guards, like 10, 20 dollars yeah. a day, you know, Mad. walk around with an AK, change hotels. And then the other ones would be somewhere in South America full of bugs, because I hate bugs, and the Congo, because I don't know that. But yeah, both Congos are just messed up. I would have to learn French to go there, but it's too much. But in regards to Somalia, I don't know if you've ever seen the YouTuber The People. Have you seen that? I think I've heard of it. So he's a, he's a Russian guy, yes. and then The People is his British YouTube, English YouTube channel, where he just has some British guy translate it oh, and yeah. speak over him. And, you know, he's very similar to you in that regard, because... He's I mean, retarded. Uh, <laughs> but no, but like, Bob Bancroft goes to Russia, and that is very interesting for people who don't know about Russia, and yeah. Soviet time stuff is very interesting. But for him, I imagine it is obviously boring being a Russian. So yeah. he goes to Somalia, he goes into Syria, and everywhere else. Yeah. And I, I do see a very similar vein in you and him, as in you will go to these messed up places, but he makes, like, documentaries about oh, he's like, how it works for the average guy. He's like a vice type of guy. Vice documentaries, like the good old ones. Doesn't he's not a scumbag, yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. he's not one of those feminists who goes to Afghanistan. <laughs> but honestly, um, he sounds like a cool guy. I might, I might try and hit him up. So yeah. if he sounds a bit similar, yeah, be an interesting collaboration or something else. Of course, a uh, good Somali who can help me get unkidnapped. I suppose the next one is um, being with you for quite a few days now. I mean, the the trip alone, just from you know Birmingham to. Oh, I want to apologise in advance, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, but from Birmingham to Kabul. I mean, like you've you've got to get along with someone to be on sort of forty hours of hanging out with them in planes and stress. Yeah. I think they've done it right. But yeah, <laughs> you were mostly asleep, so you didn't hear the rambling. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's it's very much getting to know your personality outside of just being a in swindle or whatever. It's exactly the same, isn't it? Well done. Yeah, but you you meme about everything. I mean, oh, like yeah. it's it's I don't know if it's something wrong with Zoomers, but like everything is a, a joke or a conversation. Everything is jokey. Everything. You know, I have my serious moments, you know, at a funeral, I'm not going to tell, you know, knock knock jokes of the cat, you know, <laughs> on the casket, yeah. <laughs> See what I mean? Like, but, but this is something that's kind of wrong with us as a generation, frankly. I mean, it's pretty right. I mean, if you take everything, oh, super serious, I've got to say, oh, bro, it's tired, oh, super serious. You know, it gets boring, that's what Vice became, that's what the general news is, that's what no one watches every day, just boring, it's not humorous. Yeah, they've got, they've got no personality. I'm bubbly in a place where you don't be bubbly normally. If I just walk around all anxious, you know. Who cares? If I walk around confident like all the bankrupt, which I am, it's fine. I mean, um, if I'm confident and jokey, it always helps me. Like, I remember I was trying to get into the compound to get evacuated from Afghanistan during that time. And there was a Turkish bloke guarding the area. And he was like, oh, no, only Turks allowed in, no British. And I go, oh, don't worry, I'm not Greek. And he just started laughing. He let me in. You know, well, imagine if I didn't, I would be still walking the streets of uh, Afghanistan to this day. Yeah, I, banter really does, it's the universal language. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I found that here with the friends we've made. So true, yeah. Right. Did that but a good joke. I wanted to ask you, just because, I mean, you're not a political individual. I mean, really, you're just a, a travelling guy when it comes down to, yeah. uh, you know. Just, just a humble Afghan traveller. Yeah, just, just a humble <laughs> travelling merchant. Yeah. But do you have any sincere political beliefs that, that influence what you do, or not? Um, I would say I'm very right-wing. Very likely, but I can't say specific, specifically for uh, YouTube. But I think we, I think we understand. I, I am based to put it lightly. You're you're definitely someone who um, wouldn't be elected to an MP anytime soon. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't. I don't believe in elections. I don't believe in democracy. I believe. See what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> democracy sucks. Um, it's really just uh, fake democracy. Democracy is not real. Uh, it doesn't work out like communism and. All the other stuff. I believe in lithology. That, that's kind of a cool idea. What, sir? Whoever can lift the most weights gets elected to be an official. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, so make would you, it. Okay, imagine, imagine I don't know, Joe Biden walks out, and then Donald Trump, he's done, he's done a Diana Ball cycles of steroids. He walks out and just starts flexing all the Arnold Schwarzenegger poses. And then you know, uh, he tries to, um, uh, Biden tries to say something, just picks him up and starts benching him. I, anyone would vote for him who's reasonable, you know? So if, if a guy walked out in a suit in a political rally and just ripped off the shirt and started flexing or just did you know, some workouts on the podium, you would vote for him no matter what. So, so you're voting, what is it, Senator Armstrong or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just picture Putin standing there in a suit you know, next to a guy who's taller than him who's like double the width. It's, it's power objection. I would love that stuff. So the next question I had was getting to know you as well uh, once we've been here. Oh dear. Holy crap, you are always on, and I mean that in a good way, in a bad way, which you is... You want to clarify what on means, so... Yeah, you so yeah. you constantly have ideas about how to do something interesting, or a new trip you want to do, or how to make some money selling this or that, 
so that you can fund it. Yeah. I, I mean, like yesterday, what was it? We, we, I, I said goodbye to you at ten o'clock at night, thinking I've got to bed now. <laughs> and then we were up to you came back, and we were up to again half eleven, discussing yeah. new things and yeah. different I like, ideas. I was like, bro. I found a way to export swords, but we need to look at a legal website. We can export swords to collectors and we can provide this proof and this is how we do with documentation. We won't go on a website for two hours almost. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's obviously good in a way because it makes you enterprising and it is what makes you the character you are in your head, you know, the risk yeah. reward, the what you decide is yeah. worth it. Yeah. But at the same time, it, 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 what's wrong with you? <laughs> I know, I feel like I'm very restless because I remember in banking I would always have to do something and I always have to be kept busy. So I can't sit in a bed and just relax sometimes. I always want to be doing something, if that makes sense, you know, taking something in. I just feel guilty for not working and even if my work is fun, like you know, this whole thing, I mean, I love this stuff. But it is work, it is what provides the food on the table. So I always need to be checking something out because I know there's a big difference between not checking out an opportunity and missing thousands of pounds or whole trips or my footage goes or something and actually having some success because you never know someone might come here next week after seeing my trips and do it 10 times better and because I did put in the efforts I was too comfortable you know so maybe I'm just autistic <laughs> we just don't know I mean a lot of the commenters have been saying that right? yeah to be fair I did take an autism test with my girlfriend when I was 16 years old now ex-girlfriend we both went into a place together and it was like a score thing and she put on a scale from one to one sorry from zero to one hundred. I think anything above twenty five meant more mildly autistic. I think I got somewhere of a range of six to eight, I can't remember which one, but I was like not autistic whatsoever. And she was like twenty seven, so my girlfriend lost that. But I was so autistic I managed to fudge the test to know what would result in a non autistic score. So really, I went way beyond one hundred and looped back around. Well, good, to, good to know, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you. It was explained a lot of things. Why do you think intelligence hasn't picked you up to, uh, number one, put you in jail, uh, number two, <laughs> to hire you? Well, if you watch the movie Lord of War Dogs and, uh, what was the other one? Lord of War? Lord of War. Everything is legal that I do. And to be fair, anything that I do that's illegal is done in countries where they can't prosecute me. Like for example, I I fudged the documents to get the South Sudanese visa, and it was a very grey area. So I created my own company, and then I gave myself a letter of recommendation saying I'll keep myself safe and keep uh, myself uh, under my own protection. So I became my own tour guide, and from that, um, it meant I didn't have to pay three grand for a real tour guide, and that got me the visa. Now that may be illegal in South Sudan. But no one is going to extradite me to South Sudan, so I play in this very grey area where there's no, there's no checks in place but on a global scale, and that's why I thrive in. I did get interviewed at airport security by the anti-terrorism police for three hours in the UK whilst going to South Sudan. They thought I was a terrorist and so on, interviewed me, talked everything through. They checked my bags, they saw I was Bibles inside my bag, yeah. so obviously <laughs> Islamic terrorists. Um, they asked me what I was doing. They stepped out of a room, demanded me of a hidden camera in the ceiling, you know, stayed perfectly still. I knew exactly what we were doing. I've seen these uh, interviews before. I, I know how to work around them. They, they assumed I was no issue. I honestly think they're just slowly monitoring me, seeing what I'm going to do. If I step out of line, they might try and do something, of course, anything illegal. But the good thing is I don't, I don't, excuse my language, but I don't shit where I live. So I'm not going to mess up. Anything in the UK or maybe US too, but anywhere else it's, it's kind of fair game, it's just how things work in these types of countries like uh, East Africa, North Africa, Afghanistan, Central Asia. Stupid so bureaucratic rules that yeah, no exactly. reasonable country uses. Yeah, I mean no, no real traveller does things all by the books when travelling to these dangerous nations and no one will admit that but there's a lot of underground stuff and everyone looks the other way, there's not a single person that gets prosecuted for it unless if they have a bad get to against someone and men enforce the law. So, I also saw that you did put it publicly on Twitter that you were doing it. No one's going to stop me, that's the thing. I mean, I, I really do hope I get recruited, but at the same time I'm too much of a public figure, so my face is out there, not going to happen, right? I do have a perfect cover story though, you know, I can go to any dangerous country for any reason. The last question I had is the, I mean, even last night we saw this with some people you were arguing with on Twitter. Yeah. Like, a fair amount of people dislike you because you just have a lack of seriousness with regards to everything. Yeah. Um, we've gone over a certain why. But what do you think of those people who just can't stand you because you make memes? I don't look at these people a second time. 
if anything, they're just entertainment for me in general because they they come to me and they don't DM me going, hey, I think uh, you know if you do this, it'd be very respectful. Uh, thanks for coming to my country. Uh, you know, I think very good things about countries like Australia. They think I'm overly kind, especially about gas and South Sudan and so on. So I, I'm trying to be fair. So I expect them to be polite because I would be polite to them if I messed them first. But they go, uh, they say 50 swears, they insult you, they call for their uncles to beat you up in Kabul. And then I'm respectfully just replying to them saying, I do not care, whatever, do something. And they never do. And these people are just empty people, empty women mostly too. They, they are, for example, this happened yesterday. They are Afghans who, at two years old, went to Germany or England or uh, New York or whatever. And they've never learned the local language, they don't even know their own culture, they just know their mom lived in Afghanistan. They think that gives them a right to comment on Afghanistan when they're, you know, they think uh, they have some belonging to it. And they're wildly out of touch. I honestly think if you got these people and put them in the country where I am, they would just fall apart instantly. They're not, they're not cultured, they're, they're migrants, they're, they're false. Uh, nationalities for both sides, you know, they're not really German at the same time. They're westernised in general. They're, um, they're false people. And I don't know if that gets me because one, they don't bring me money, views, interest, resources, kindness. There's nothing of value that I would need to please them. And everyone knows where I fall politically on Twitter, as you probably see from my shit posts. So I'm not going to please these people anyway. They are my audience. They're only for me people. They're only for me to have beef with very politely, mind you. So I can provide some entertainment for people. They're just, I would say they're tools if they don't even know it. No, it's fair. Yeah. I, I think it's very fair with a lot of them. And uh, certainly, I mean, if I was left here on my own, it just turned out I would fall apart in this place. I mean, just the walk from the airport to here was uh, shocking. I mean, I expected much of it, but it's... Yeah. You know, to move them here, they would it's, have them. It, yeah, I just... Yeah, no. Um, I have people DMing me all the time saying, I want to go to this country. And they ask very basic questions. And I, I appreciate them reaching out and asking for help. But there's some things you have to really do yourself. Because if I provide all the information, if you run into a problem here, you have... You know what to do. You have no idea what to do. And truthfully, I don't want anyone dying because I went someplace and they thought it was great. You know? So I always disclose, you know, I do things because I have a like, special niche for this, you know, it's, it's kind of my thing. So if you do, just make sure you pay triple the amount of that I do. Because I am retarded, somehow get away with it, and maybe I have a guardian angel, but then, then maybe not as lucky. <laughs> yeah, I mean, whilst we've been here, we've had stories on kidnappings, uh, as you say, multiple bombings have been going on. Yeah. Uh, one of the UN people here said that people, one of theirs had been stabbed in the last week. So yeah. it's, well, not, it's not they like... They returned to Birmingham, by the way. <laughs> yeah, which they're in much more danger for that one. But uh, I suppose we should move on to talking about the country itself. Um, yes. So you've got a better perspective on this than I do. I've only got Taliban control of Afghanistan, or at least control of Kabul, yeah. to make any kind of inference about the future. But you've been here, you've seen what's changed since yeah. the fall. A lot has changed. And uh, what do you think about the future of Afghanistan? So it's very complex. I, I do think China will colonize it to some degree, because there is three trillion in, mineral, in minerals here, so there's so much gold. Uh, the US provided kind of census data for where the gold actually is. Very specifically, it's like 500 million right here. And you know, it's this deep and it's how easy it is to get. And China will love that stuff, so it's going to get as much resource as it can. As it can. Uh, Belt of Road Initiative, you know, branching out. It's why we saw Chinese uh, posters everywhere, right? You know, they're trying to integrate and see this opportunity. When the West screws up and leaves, China moves in, kind of rebuilds and colonizes economically. So I think either China's going to take over um, as the country struggles economically due to sanctions, which is unfortunate, or there's going to be some more infighting. So I would say ISIS makes up, um, there's one ISIS member for every 20 Taliban members, but ISIS are ruthless, so the Taliban are actually very afraid of them, which is understandable, I don't blame them, who isn't scared of ISIS, right? So there will be some infighting. Um, every, every spring, summer and autumn, that's when fighting happens, and it stops during winter. So there'll be some sort of work. Uh, the World Food Programme's here, so there's, uh, there's some food shortages, but it's not as bad as people say on the media. We look around and there, are, there is a bit of trouble due to the sanctions, but I think it's mostly fine to some degree. I think the situation is a little bit brighter than it actually is. I think the Taliban are going to start with some industry. They're very strict with Islamic law, which has actually improved some stuff. So they banned 
prostitution uh, cracked down on it, at least drug use too, so now there's rehab for everyone. There's, uh, there's, um, there's no druggies in the streets anymore, apart from the occasional one who gets put into rehab. Then there used to be roads where there would just be prostitutes everywhere, they cracked down upon that. They returned to traditional Shia, uh, Shia law, was it? Sharia. Sharia, fuck me. Damn. I'd cut that, please. Please cut that. <laughs> um, I think the situation of Afghanistan can either go the way of the Congo, where it's exploited to hell. But I think the people here are too strong, they'll be too exposed to the outside world to actually see that happen. I, I see it becoming, I would say, a stronger nation over the next 30 years, but there is going to be a readjustment period as we're seeing. So, on the, on the future aspects, just some thoughts I've had, no matter what yeah. you think of them. So, on the food part, I've certainly seen no one who's uh, chubby, but I will admit, after reading a lot about North Korean's famine, China's famine, yeah. this doesn't look like famine conditions, this looks like a third world country, and that's better than famine. Yeah, I sure. mean, you've been on life support for the last 20 years, the US isn't giving away free or heavily subsidized food, local farmers can't obviously compete with free food, right, so they never really set up the infrastructure to some degree, and then after you take away all that aid overnight, and set up a new government, there's a transition period. It's like South Korea was very poor um, after the Korean War, but then it became very economically rich over, you know, uh, over some time, but there was a large adjustment period. So I, I hope Afghanistan turns out really good, because I like this country a lot. People here were kind, food's generally good, as you found, half of the food poisoning occasionally. Um, country's nice, beautiful place, um, brighter than Birmingham to some degree. Uh, Weather's lovely. Yeah, more white people. Uh, than <laughs> <laughs> Un ironically, I think so, because if you go to the northern areas near Tajikistan, there's a huge white population yeah, that course. actually outnumbers the white people in England. And we were in that mall yesterday, the posh mall, where all the rich yes. people are. I did notice that a lot of them are a lot whiter than a lot of people like, yeah. you would call white in, the, in Europe. There's a strong caste system, so there's a joke that the area of Kandahar is full of homosexuals. Um, but or boy lovers, that's what we say. So if you go there, it's Afghanistan like, slander. Just yeah, yeah, that's that's what <laughs> the strangest people, boy in Canada. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not encouraging <laughs> it. I'm just saying that's what people in Kabul, Taiwan have said to me. They said they like white boys. If you go down, they'll call you beautiful and touch your back and stuff like that. So it's a bit weird, and of course it's against uh, Sharia law. So fair enough. But that's the general census for whole of the whole thing. It's there's there's so much shit posting that goes on in the center, and I'm not too sure what's true, but. You know, they, uh, it's like a caste system, so if you're white, you're seen as beautiful. You were called beautiful, weren't you? Yeah, we got pulled over by the Taliban, and uh, I didn't know at the time, but the translator said afterwards that they were hitting on me. Yeah. Which I'm flattered, but no thanks. Yeah. So. I remember when I was in the park once, one of, our, one of my drivers, we were just sitting, eating grapes and stuff in the park. You know, it kind of clicks now that I was meant to be romantic or something. But he leans over and goes, you're so beautiful. I'm like, he's like, your eyes so blue. I'm like... Thanks, mate. <laughs> yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, yeah, I'm not. No. <laughs> right. Yeah, so um, that's, that's, that's apparently a thing. So that's, that's the one other thing, just to end on with the future aspect, is we've heard rumours here that apparently the Qataris are the ones now looking most likely to take over the airport. Yeah. And if, because the problem is, as soon as the airport's back online, the UN and loads of other people are going to come back in, loads of money will start flying, not as yeah. much as before, but more. Yeah. And the one requirement is, internationally, the airport has to be secure. And having the Taliban run it, international are not accepting that. Yeah. They want foreign troops protecting the airports. Oh, yeah. So the Qataris or Emirates are going to be the ones most likely doing that. And at that sure. point, things might change. Yeah. If they don't get to that point, it's just going to continue like it is. Yeah, but that's so why the Taliban are really protecting that airport. Yeah, it's, it's a very important airport. Um, when we walk past it, there's about 50 guards just standing around on every rooftop. Just um, sniffer dogs, even though dogs are not meant to be used in uh, Islamic law. So, you know, they're really putting at every single stop just to make sure that ISIS does not attack by airports. And to be fair, that's our only planned way out at the moment. Um, so, yeah. And there are, there are about I don't know, four to six or something airports dotted around the country. Some of them just airstrips, some of them full fledged airports. You can fly internally too, domestically. So, if it does happen, distribution will go forward I and mean, then everyone can just get food a lot easier. But I really, I really, one thing I don't like about the UN, and you agree with this earlier too, 
they don't bring tractors or fertilizer or show people how to actually farm properly, not to the capacity that's needed. They just give them food and make them reliant on it. That's sort of the plan, which is, you know, there's a famine to just throw food out, which is, you know, one thing. Yeah, but like, it's. But like, I don't know to what degree they do do the planning stuff, but I've not seen any. Well, I've not I seen just, anyone with a tractor. I mean, petrol here is kind of relatively cheap. We saw the World Food Programme planes when we landed, being yeah. unloaded. Yeah, yeah, same with South Sudan. I mean, it's just more food. If I remember the statistic, if the World Food Programme left South Sudan and no one left South Sudan, so let's say there was a big border around it, I think 75% 75 of, pe of people of the entire population would just starve to death. Because they're just now dependent on farm yeah. aid. Yeah. It's complex. I said on the, the one other thing I just want to end on, which is, um, I think you probably agree with this as well. Yeah. Being here, if it wasn't for the Taliban, this place would be in another civil war. Yeah. I honestly would say, so there's the Afghan national, um, there's, there's a resistance movement basically. Uh, I won't go into details, but the resistance movement was meant to uh, take back Afghanistan, hold a few provinces and so on. They, all the people fled. They were, they were um, paid by you know, international governments unofficially. They fled to France, the UK, everything like that. So all the leaders are gone. Their numbers are very small. It's just people who have been westernised who want to see like, a democratic Afghanistan. But that just doesn't work here. Dem it's not the reality yeah. of the people in the place, yeah. at democracy, least from what we see. Yeah. Democracy doesn't work in Afghanistan. So um, I, I believe there was one quote where they, they tried to do democracy and they said, what, why are we voting for another president? We've already got one. Why do we need to, why do we need to replace it? It's working. And they also said, well, the village leaders just basically force us to vote for a certain person that fills their interests. So it's just like the West, a small subgroup of people controlling the media and also influencing the people to put certain people in power. That type of thing. It's all, it's all theatre, so democracy wouldn't work in general. And to be fair, I, I'm glad to have done it here because ISIS would take over and then it's just genocide. I didn't tell anyone this before, but I actually felt it was a little bit unsafe on some days when I was first here. Because when I went to this one tourist spot on my first trip back in August before the Taliban takeover, I got a friend with knives once, and then some people uh, like spat on the floor when they saw me. Now everyone's respectful. There's no, there's no hooligans on the streets. There's security. You might see the Taliban with a gun and think, oh, it's very dangerous, but they will literally just give you food if you ask. Yeah, they're not ISIS, they're not... Yeah, they're, they're trying to keep you safe to some degree. They're trying to make this work. And to be honest, they're not... They haven't gone through the education of every Western leader, clearly not, and understandably. But they have a lot of potential, and I honestly think, you know, we have to support them as much as we can so they actually improve in general, which they will do. Because that's, that's my perspective on this somewhat, is... Who else? No one else. No, the US isn't coming back, it's too expensive, and they... They never really had a hold on the country. They had no idea how it actually worked. They were just going through bureaucracy. Pakistan, no. Iran hates them. Sheikhistan, all the other stands up north, no, not really. Um, there's no one else. The Taliban are the only people. Maybe there'll be some more new resistance group that pops up, but I really doubt it. You know, they're doing just fine at the moment. I walk around the streets, I see happy faces. I talk to people very kind. Uh, they actually say good stuff about Afghanistan. Most of the women don't wear full face, uh, was it burkas? Burkas, yeah. yeah. They don't wear full face burkas. Hijab is very common. I would say 10% of people are wearing you know, full face coverings in Kabul and about 30% outside of Kabul because it gets a little bit less liberal. Um, human right abuses, maybe occasionally, but any government that's new, I, it, I, would, I don't say it's understandable, but you Again, see like, it's, it's compared to what? Yeah, exactly. Like, and in this place, but the alternative right now is ISIS. Yeah. So. Oh, I mean, the people complaining, the politicians and the, and the governments and the uh, what else, the uh, journalists. I honestly think if you put them in charge, they would they would destroy the country within weeks.